Coming up on the program, it's about time for fall and freezing, how we can get our tomatoes to ripen before that happens. And three things that we have done that we have found that has worked phenomenal. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by For all your non-GMO, heirloom, organic, vegetable, flowers, and herb seeds, visit dollarseed.com. Sue Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sue's, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit SueGrowingSupply.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind, and soil hose and filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind, and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew, 100% organic. Visit ManureTea.com. Rain Reserve. Reserving your rain, preserving our future. Rain Reserve, manufacturing of rainwater capturing capabilities. Visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on your tomato purchase. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. We are in our tomato, one of our tomato patches here, and it's getting close to that time where our first average frost date is merely about 30 days away. Now average last frost date, now that is determined over the last 10 years of frost, first frost dates and they average the date. And ours here in southeast Wisconsin in zone 5A, 5B, based on where we're gardening, is about October 11th to the 18th. So we're about one month to that period. Now also, that doesn't mean it's gonna happen. We've harvested tomatoes as late as the second week in November. And we've also had snow on the ground as, as the second week of November has arrived too. So we've got a lot of tomatoes that are in different stages of ripening or development that we want to get ripe before, the, before it freezes, before a frost, because a frost will kill them. Now, we have had some frost not kill tomatoes. So this is one of those eight plus eight is not always 16 uh, solutions here. So what we're gonna do here, there's several different techniques in which you can exercise in getting your tomatoes to get to that ripe stage quicker. Now, first of all, let's talk about the tomatoes. On a tomato plant, you've got the blossom or you got the flower here. From the time you see that flower to the time that coloration begins to occur on the bottom of the tomato and then a few days later, you're looking about 20 to 30 days based on the type of tomato plant, the variety and the size and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we pick them when we do see a pigment taste, uh, a color pigmentation change at the bottom, simply because uh, we can bring them inside and within two, three days top, setting them on a counter in indirect sunlight, just ambient light, they will ripen and they're just as tasty. And it, it saves from critters and uh, other things getting a hold of these and eating them and damaging them. So we're talking 20 to 30 days from the time we see the flower to the time that it is ready to harvest. So that's right in that window. So what you can do here is a couple of things. One, you can take your shears or your snippers or your scissors and you can begin to trim the tops out uh, of the plant. This has no flowers on it whatsoever. So what I'm doing here is I'm just cutting back some of the green here to stop vertical growth and work on more of the fruit development. Now this is very similar as in garlic. We harvest the scapes and some of you may notice after the scape is harvested, the plant goes, uh, dies back relatively quicker than if you, on, than on plants that you allow the scapes to continue to grow. Simply because the scape is the seed production of the plant. Once the plant feels that the seeds are mature, 
the plant dies back, its life cycle is over. By removing that scape, you're essentially telling the plant, hey, you're done, and it will start dying back. So it's kind of the same process here. We're stopping or we're telling the plant, hey, stop top growth, work on your reproduction of seeds and the tomatoes and, uh, uh, before it freezes. Now also, this is an also great time if you are going to do indoor growing, you can take cuttings. This is a Cherokee purple cherry tomato, and you can just take a cutting like this, put in water, in about a week you'll, be see, you'll have roots develop, and you can plant this inside in your grow room, or if you're in an area where it doesn't freeze, you can propagate these plants over and over again. And, and we're doing this with our new uh, growing series, Growing Indoors with the Eco Garden System. You can find that on our website, thewisconsinvegetablegarden.com. We'll be growing all through the winter with this unique indoor greenhouse. So we can do that. Another thing you can do is cut the water off to the plant. We have irrigation set up here, but we've had excessive amount of water. It rains about every three days. For some of you, that's incredible. That would be wonderful. Others of you, you don't want no more rain where you're at. So we can't really cut the water. We can stop irrigation. That's what we have done. But we can't really, you know, put a tent over the tomato plants and uh, prevent them from ab absorbing any more water. But that is also a way to stress the plant. And that's what we're doing. We're stressing the plant because any plant, as we've discussed in the program, that is stressed will stop growth and work on seed production or fruit production to carry on the genetics of that plant for the next generation. And that's what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to get the plant into such a stress that it doesn't grow anymore. It just produces all the fruit that's currently on the plant because ripe tomatoes are much more enjoyable than having to bring in or do different things with green tomatoes to maximize your yield. So that's another thing. Another one, uh, another trick that you can perform is cutting the roots. And you just take a shovel and it sounds like a terrible, terrible thing, but about ha around half of the plant, about eight, 10 inches away, just jam your shovel in there and you'll cut some of those roots that also cause less water to be absorbed into the plant as well as a stress indicator or a, 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 the plant will indicate there's a problem and also stress the plant out. You can also just kind of yank on the plant a little bit vertical as well and that will also encourage some of the root to uh, be broken in that sense as well. Now you can also, you know, throughout the season, you can trim these back and we can also trim some of these back. Uh, like I talked about, you want to trim the top portions back. I would avoid trimming a lot of the side growth because the plant is designed by nature to allow the tomato to ripen, but also have some protection to where it doesn't sunburn these tomatoes. If you remove a lot of the plants, the leaves and the foliage and open it up a lot, you're going to encourage that plant to, or the, the fruit to be sunburned and it's gonna be really uh, not worth the effort. It's gonna be in, in some cases uh, not able to be eaten. So keep that in mind. We are going to do minimal uh, stress to these plants because again we may have a, another 60 days of growing or we may have another 15 days of growing. Uh, we will go until we can't go no more and if we do see an end in sight then we will kind of uh, see where we're at in the situation of development on fruit and go from there. So if you're wanting to end the season on a high note and have all ripe tomatoes those steps will greatly increase your chances of doing such. So I'm going to make what are called lacto-fermented pickles, which is basically a way to make pickles without using any vinegar. They will have probiotic properties because you are doing the fermentation of them, but they do have a really nice pickly, garlicky, some people call them sour pickles. This is a way people preserve food before they had refrigerators, uh, before they had access to things like um, canning, they all did it in a crock. So first we're gonna start out with our brine or our, yeah, our brine. So I'm putting five tablespoons of salt, pickling salt, or you can use sea salt into, what was three, four, let me just count here, into two quarts of water. And we're doing this in a half gallon size jar. I got this recipe from uh, cultures for health I, I they have good information on their website so then you just stir it up okay but it dissolves pretty easily now a lot of times when you make home well pickles in general they have a tendency to get mushy so I'm going to talk about that here I use black black tea 
um, tea bags. And I make sure I use the bags that don't have any string or staples because metal is can be reactive when it comes to home fermentation. As you can see, I'm using a wooden spoon to stir. And um, so I use the, the black tea bags. So I put one in the bottom. And then what I do is I put my garlic cloves in the bottom as well. And that's six to nine of those. And then I use dill seed. You can use fresh dill. You can use um, dill weed, which is like ground dill. And then just add my rest of my salt there. I'm going to use, uh, let's see, I usually use for a quart, I usually use about two, two tablespoons or so. So we'll use about, we'll see what we got here. I think that's pretty good. I'll do an extra tablespoon. Just gonna add more flavor. Okay, now you can add pickling spices or not. It's really up to you what you wanna do here. I do, I like the way it tastes. Some people choose not to. They just go with the garlic and the dill. I just wash my <laughs> scissors so I gotta put them back together. And I get this from my local grocery store um, or you can get it from a spice shop. You, it really just depends on, on where you are. You can order it online. And I get this actually from, it's, I find these packages near the bulk section of the grocery store. You can sometimes, you can probably buy it in like a container too, you know, the baking section, but I like it near the bulk section. So I did a tablespoon there. I don't like a lot of, too much, I don't want too much pickling spice. So as you can see, my salt has dissolved. So that'll be ready to go and just, when we're ready for it. And... Now what you want to do here is you want to cut off the ends of your your pickles. Okay, so these are ones we grew. Um, you can use any size. You get them from the farmer's market. You can, you can buy them from the store. You can quarter them or half them. We're going to um, use them whole. So I'm just going to get the ends chopped off and we'll get the jars loaded up. So I got my my ends chopped off. I have my spices in there. I have my black tea bag. You can use grape leaves, oak leaves, um, or you can use the black tea. I just, since I have a lot of tea, I buy a lot of tea. I figure I might as well just use that. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take our brine and we're just going, and you want to use unchlorinated water and you want it to be cool or room temperature. You just pour it in there. And as you can see, some of the spices come up. I'm going to put my bag on there and then these probably won't float if they do float you can put a little weight on there this won't float because it's kind of this is underneath the shoulder and so it's holding them down they're packed in there a little bit tightly which is okay and then what we're going to do is we're going to add our airlock um if you don't have an airlock that's okay you can take a coffee filter with a rubber band put it around there some people take like a sock with like a hole in it something that allows it to breathe and then you don't have to stir it every day, especially if you put a weight on it, but just you wanna check it and make sure it's gonna bubble. These will take anywhere from, depending on the, the heat and humidity in your house, it'll take anywhere from a week to two weeks, just depending. And you'll know because um, it'll start to get bubbly. You can always taste, taste the top one, but I wouldn't taste it sooner than a week unless you really, unless it's like, I don't know, really super hot and humid in your house. So I'll get the lid on in just a second, but I just wanted to let you know that um, if you do if you do this, you want to make sure that you keep it away from direct sunlight, and you just want to check it every day. I check my ferments twice a day. It's just what I'm used to doing, and that's pretty much it. You got ch any extra brine that you may have, you can use for another project, or you can put it in the refrigerator and use it within a couple days. So there we have it. We have our our pickles ready to go and we'll have to see how they come out. I, I will put the recipe in the show notes below. I, I didn't follow it quite exactly because it says to use fresh dill and I don't have any fresh dill, but you can, you can use a dill seed. That's no problem. It does say six to nine cloves of garlic. I like my pickles more garlicky. So I did use the nine cloves as well. So I got my, my airlock on. I'm going to put the little lid on and remember you want to use non-chlorinated water even in your airlock. So keep that in mind. We have well water, which does not have chlorine, so that's what we use. Um, so once they're ready, once your pickles are ready, you can go ahead and you can move them to your fridge or root cellar. I put a different lid on on them before you do that so you can reuse your airlocks. 
if you or if you have a coffee filter or whatever just make sure you get a lid on them and then they're good to go they keep for a few months they will continue to ferment a teeny bit in a cooler area but not at the rapid rate of room temperature so a lot of times we see things on social media and we just assume that it's truth but as we know from commercials that not everything on the internet is true but we found three things that we have implemented in our garden that has worked. Things we've seen on social media, other gardeners, as well as a little uh, added tweaks that we have implemented from our own experience. So we're gonna talk about those three things so you can implement them in your garden this year or remember them for next year. One being this cardboard mulch. Now, the bed that I'm standing in is, very, is identical to the bed that has got the turnips in. This bed was left fallow because I wanted all of our straw bale garden vines of the melons and the winter squashes to uh, grow over on this side, which they were beginning to do, and this had a lot of weeds coming up in it. So two, week, uh, two months ago, we went ahead and weed whacked this down on a straight to the point and laid one to two, sometimes three layers of cardboard in this area. Behind me, we ran out of cardboard and you can see what it looks like with the foxtail and the thistles growing naturally. Well, this had worked very, very well. The only weeds that have come up is through the cracks that weren't sealed or over layered. Works phenomenal. We will definitely do this again in the next year when it comes to growing vines. Uh, we do have some, wild, uh, some parsley coming up here from last year, coming up through a crack. We got some vine here, but nothing compared to what it would have looked like as it does behind me. Well, uh, cardboard mulch works great. Now, some of you may be concerned about the glue and the toxicity of all that, but that's a decision that you have to make for your particular garden. Now, let's look at the second thing that has worked very, very well for us that we've had some feedback on that may not work for you. The second thing that has worked for us very well is incorporating bird seed in tin cans in amongst our tomatoes. We were having a very difficult problem tracking down the tomato hornworm that was eating tomatoes on a very rapid pace for, uh, in our garden here. So what we did, we took several fence posts or uh, several uh, wooden posts put tin cans on them, poked some holes in the bottom for drainage, and filled it with bird seed. And the birds have just loved it. We've had to refill this multiple times. And since we have implemented this in our garden, in the two months that we've done it, I think we've had one tomato that has in, been indicated that has been eaten by, uh, been nibbled on by the hornworm. We were getting five or six a week that were being damaged. So incredible change. Now, the feedback we've gotten from some viewers is, well, the birds, you want to keep birds out of your tomato patch because they're going to peck holes in your tomatoes. Well, birds do peck holes in tomatoes. They are pecking holes in tomatoes because they are needing moisture. Uh, the, the birds are thirsty, so they're looking for water. So one way you can do uh, combat that is incorporate a, a bird bath in amongst your garden. That will, number one, bring in, you know, allow the birds to have something to drink as well as other beneficial insects. But two, it will also prevent the birds from pecking holes or slowing the hole pecking down in your tomatoes. What you can also do early in the season to prevent that is hang plastic red Christmas balls on your uh, tomato cages to mimic red ripe tomatoes and the birds will peck that and go elsewhere. But if you just provide them with water or uh, we've had a lot of rain here and we've never yet this year have experienced holes being pecked in our tomatoes via birds. So we've got three different placing of the bird seed in the tin cans and it has worked phenomenal. We've never had, uh, we've had, the, the hornworms have disappeared uh, because we, the birds come in, they'll feed off the bird seed, they'll notice worms moving around and birds feed in the early morning and late at night, so does the hornworm. And uh, we believe that is what has been eliminating the damage to our, the, eliminating the hornworms, which are damaging our tomatoes. The third thing that has worked very, very well for us is we implemented in the front yard uh, the front yard garden, we placed party cups in the ground one inch above ground level because we were having a massive amount of problem with slugs. We put uh, beer into the cups and even with torrential downpours, the beer that emits the hop smell attracted the slugs and the cup is just overflowing with dead slugs. So if you have problems with slugs, use a beer that will attract them 
into your gar or attract them to the cup and then they won't eat the uh, produce that you're trying to grow. So three things that we have found, we have implemented and have worked in our garden. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.